two very boring minutes later. On the cold block nights, now you front row for the spotlight. Not a diamonds in the auto mob bright. Just with superhero movies being the new base form for modern entertainment in Hollywood these days, and cinematic universes being the new goal to strive for, production studios like Sony and DC just simply don't know when to cut their losses and maybe realize that there's another path that could lead to a successful franchise, backed by its fandom and raking in the money that they really care about. Unfortunately, that isn't the reality that we're living in right now. So we're stuck with boring, unimaginative, underwhelming, bland, and safe films that happen to hit our theaters year after year. Superhero movies are really the easiest type of film to make, and it's easy to say that Marvel just laid out the blueprint for how success could be achieved, but I think that that's the issue that Hollywood is facing now. The Marvel formula works for Marvel because it is the formula for Marvel, not only in their movies, but the way that they simply go about their movie making process and the timing and planning that goes into it as well. Sony Pictures got off to a really great start with the Tobey Maguire Spider-Mans, making a trilogy of successful and planned out films from beginning to end, giving our characters structures and goals that can be built upon and a plot that was progressing just as fast as our characters. They tried again with the reboot of The Amazing Spider-Man, and while the character has definitely gotten a recent revival because of the latest Marvel-produced Spider-Man movie, those fans were nowhere to be seen to make sure that he got a completed trilogy. My point is, is because of the fabricated pressure that Sony seems to put on themselves because of the success of the MCU, Sony seems to be in a rush to get out their own cinematic universe to capitalize on the money and the fandom that a successful superhero franchise could bring to your studios. And after carefully looking over the small list of fan favorite characters that they actually have the rights to, the first victim to start off the disastrous Sony Cinematic Spider-Verse was Venom. It was an easy choice for Sony, if I'm being completely honest. We've never really gotten a big screen adaptation of the character, only showing up for a brief period of time in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy in the third act of the third film, which wasn't really met with a lot of fanfare when it came to the two previous films. It was definitely a misstep of trying to display the iconic Spider-Man villain on the big screen for the first time, so this was really a no-brainer when it came to finally giving the character his own adaptation, but right away the studio soon realized of its own misdoings. When Venom first hit theaters, people were quick to realize that this was a movie that they'd seen a million times over. Another safe and bland movie for Sony to make a quick buck off a character that is recognizable and undershown on the big screen. I would be lying to you if I told you that the banter between Eddie and Venom didn't have me chuckling from time to time, but that's the only thing the movie really had going for it. A villain that was so one note that he was just one step away from being the trope of a mustache twirling villain, a love story that was so forgettable and passionless that I don't even remember if they broke up or ended up together by the end of the film, and a CGI mess in the third act that was so dark that I didn't even know which Venom was which. And when it comes to the second attempt of Sony trying to reel me in into the nonsense that they're releasing in Venom Let There Be Carnage, you soon feel as if you're watching the same exact film as previously, with just a shred of charisma from Woody Harrelson. <laughs> What are you doing? Sony keeps getting in their own way, not really knowing how to make a compelling superhero story and showing their lack of understanding for a character like Venom. Because the two main problems that this movie faces is runtime being only a brisk hour and 26 minutes and it's PG-13 rating to make sure that they can get all of the butts in the seats and money in their pockets. I feel as if as moviegoers in Hollywood have come to a healthy medium in understanding that two hour films are just long enough to keep the moviegoer interested without making them feel as if it's too long or energy consuming. In Hollywood, to tell an interesting and compelling story with more of a complete vision of what they're trying to bring to the screen. Sony seems to have missed the ball on that when it came to Venom 2 because with a runtime as short as this, it brings a boring, vanilla, soulless rehash of a movie that we have already seen before. The movie picks up around two years after the events of the first, going through the same movie beats as previously. We're introduced to yet another villain that happens to get the power of the Venom symbiote, and therefore finding an easy alternative to further their own goals. A love story that seems to think that the audience actually is invested into Eddie and Anne's relationship, and a symbiotic relationship that Eddie and Venom have formed in the first movie, and the internal dynamic of what it's like for two conscious beings to be living in a soul body. 
Again, I'd be lying to you if I said the dynamic between Eddie and Venom still didn't have me laughing in this movie just like the first, which is still the only real interesting and engaging storyline of the entire film. Venom is a symbiotic alien, a simple creature that just wants to eat brains and fight bad guys, while Eddie is still coming to the gripes that he might not be able to go back to the normal life that he was living before meeting Venom. The two have a classic relationship of wanting to grow but not knowing how to grow together, and by the end of the movie, there was enough growth and development between the two characters that if this movie actually got a third installment, we would actually see what Eddie and Venom could truly bring to the table as a coexisting being. Woody Harrelson is a great actor and all, but honestly, the script never gave him anything to work with from a character perspective. His character Cletus was a broken man from the very beginning, sent to a home for broken children for the murders of countless people, including his own mom and grandmother, and eventually waiting in solitude on death row for his numbered days to eventually come to an end. There's some scenes where the script tries to tell me his backstory of being a beaten down kid that eventually led him to becoming the serial killer that he is in the present day. And the only thing that he was truly looking for was a family and more specifically friendship from Eddie. But with a short runtime and I assume studio interference, it's never shown to me on screen. Before Cletus eventually bites and tastes the blood of Eddie, allowing him to manifest his own symbiotic relationship with Carnage, which doesn't make any type of sense to begin with, but okay. We only see them meet one time, never establishing any true personal dynamics between the characters, even though I'm led to believe that there is. If movies like Deadpool or Logan or even shows like The Boys, it's established that superhero movies could be rated R and still rake in tons of money if done right, and Venom is definitely a character that falls under that category. Venom and Carnage are symbiotes that survive off the substance only found in human brains and chocolate for some reason. Chocolate? Did you say chocolate? Chocolate? CHOCOLATE! If the substance of your protagonist and antagonist needs to survive and become more powerful on is found in human brains, I would assume that you would know that the audience is prepared and honestly something that everybody would want to see. And I'm not asking you to go all Game of Thrones and show absolutely everything, but if you're going to name your movie Let There Be Carnage, you would think that you would make a movie that could actually live up to the expectations of its own name. The perfect example is the prison scene. For the first time you're introduced to the character of Carnage, being somewhat of a psychotic symbiote himself and taking on the personality traits of someone like Cletus, it was the perfect way to showcase the abilities and the sheer power difference between the two Venoms. But with the lack of blood and actual destruction of the people being shown on screen, we're just left with an underwhelming CGI monster destroying a building. Where have I seen this before? With better jokes and mild improvements on the set pieces and the CGI actually being able to differentiate the two symbiotes by at least color, which is a step up from the first, you're still left with an uneventful movie experience that you'll forget in about five minutes after watching. And with a post credit scene teasing the crossover between the Sony Venom and the MCU, it's obvious that Sony is doing anything at this point to stay relevant for the forever moving forward MCU counterpart. And with a character like Venom, I don't understand how we can fumble the bag this hard. If you liked the video, then definitely make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel to go check out some of the other movies that we've discussed. And always make sure to comment down how you felt about Venom Let There Be Carnage, because this is just my opinion and I'm looking forward to hearing yours. But that's all the words I got for today, so goodbye. This castle is in unacceptable condition! Unacceptable!